Hey everyone, I'm Mind, and the first 10 episodes of Ninjago Dragons Rising released yesterday, so I want to make this video just to talk about my thoughts on all of it. This, of course, will not be the last time I talk about all this. I'll actually probably be doing a live stream this weekend with some other people, where you can hear my more in-depth thoughts and everything in a more, like, discussion format. But yeah, I just want to make a short video for you all, just giving you my review of this season, both spoiler-free and with spoilers, because I just have a lot of thoughts running through my head, and I really want to talk about them. If you haven't watched the season yet, it is available right now on Netflix. In a lot of countries, it's not available everywhere yet, but I believe it's coming to like the UK on the 5th and it should be out everywhere by the end of June and of course this is only the first half of the season the second half should be releasing later this year in fall but anyway yeah I guess we'll start this video out by me giving you my spoiler free review and in short I love this season I actually made a little tweet about everything so maybe it's actually good to go through the points I made over here but yeah first thing 22 minute episodes are back and wow they just changed so much like I always knew 22 minute episodes were better than 11 minute but I honestly didn't think there was a huge difference between them but now finally seeing new episodes in the 22 minute style it's just like wow where has this been because every time i was watching an episode i was kind of waiting for it to end right i was like oh wow this is a really cool concept but it's gonna be over super quick and then i checked the runtime of the episode and there's still like 15 minutes left and it felt like there was enough time to develop every single idea that the show had nothing felt rushed which is so nice to see because i can't say that for all the wild brain seasons because i think definitely by like the end of the season 11 through season 15 cycle they'd gotten a better hang of the 11 minute episodes but even still a lot of times it just felt like they were trying to cram too much into too little space and with dragons rising that wasn't the case at all my second point is this season just gives me major season one vibes. I'll get into this more when we talk about the actual episodes with spoilers, but it did that thing where like there is the main overarching plot, but then there's also a lot of little subplots that are just self-contained in one episode, and those actually do help further the main plot while also just being their own little stories, and that's just fun to me. That's what Ninjago should be. That's what I loved as a kid, because that makes each episode iconic, right? It doesn't make them all blend together. If I think back to like season one Ninjago, each episode had its own identity, but then the main story with the Great Devourer was being built off the entire time, right? It feels like that's what they're doing here. Now, the last few episodes of the season are more of just like one cohesive story together. However, that's okay. I think it's good to have a mix of both. I'm loving the new characters so far. Aaron, Sora, Wildfire, Rapton, Roz, or Raz. They actually pronounce it both ways in the show, but it seems like it's Roz more often, as well as Empress Beatrix. And of course, I can't not mention Baby Ryu. Focusing on like this much smaller cast of characters, I think is a great thing. Each character is like a really compelling backstory, and the way they fit into the story of the show is just so natural. The animation is gorgeous too. Now, there are a few animation errors, but that's bound to happen every now and then. However, the colors are just so vibrant, especially compared to the last few seasons. That's my biggest issue with, like, the pre-Dragons Rising Wild Brain seasons. A lot of times they just felt quite dull, and that's not the case at all here. The lighting is really great, too, and sometimes they use these really cool effects that are sort of similar to, like, what we've seen in, like, Spider-Verse, which it was awesome to see that in Ninjago. But yeah, it's got, like, the amazing action that season 11 through 15 had, while also still looking really nice, like seasons 1 through 10 did. It is the perfect mixture, in my opinion. I'm loving it so far. But then the most important thing about the show for me that actually really makes me love it is how much respect the show actually actually has for Ninjago's history. Now, I can't get into this too much without going into spoiler territory, but I know there was a lot of worries, like, this is a new show, there's, like, new characters that are being focused on, the original ninja are being sidelined a bit, and a lot of people were worrying that, like, oh, this is just gonna be a different thing, it's not gonna be entirely like Ninjago. And while I had faith in the writers, I was a little bit worried, too, because from the beginning, they're advertising this as, hey, if you've never seen Ninjago before, you could just pick up the show right here, and you don't have to watch the original show, which is obviously a good thing to get new fans watching the show. However, it made me worry that they were just gonna throw out all this lore that they've built up for so long. But I was happy to see that wasn't the case at all. Introducing the new characters is actually a really smart way to go about it, because even though us as the viewers like know a lot about the Ninjago world, Aaron and Sora don't necessarily. So there's quite a few things from the original show that get reintroduced here, and they're able to introduce those concepts to new viewers in a really easy way just by simply having Lloyd explain the concept to Aaron and Sora. It doesn't feel forced at all. And yeah, honestly, there are so many things that like tie back to original show lore. A lot of things I wasn't expecting to see that were genuinely super cool. So if you haven't watched the season yet, I highly recommend it. If you're a fan of the old show but we're worried about this one I would say give it a try I don't think you'll be disappointed especially with what happens towards the end of the first half but I think that's about it for my spoiler free review so if you haven't watched Ninjago Dragons Rising yet and you don't want to be spoiled click off this video now and then come back later after you've watched it but now I think I'm just gonna go episode by episode and just give you my thoughts and everything but yeah there will be spoilers for the show in this section I'll be discussing everything so this is your last and final warning to click off the video if you don't want to see spoilers so starting with episode one the merge part one I like how this episode starts out from Aaron's perspective because of course Aaron is the main character of this new show, but I was fully expecting the first episode to be like from Lloyd's perspective or something. But yeah, it's neat that we don't see the ninja for most of it. This episode does a lot to establish Aaron and Sora and who the claws of Imperium are. I will say most 
of the footage we saw in like trailers and clips and whatnot came from this episode and the next one. So as such, I had felt like I'd already seen a lot of this episode, but that doesn't make it bad by any means. That's just due to the marketing for the show. Rapton's a lot of fun as a villain. I really like him. It was cool seeing all the different characters in the crossroads too. They confirmed that the villains from Ninjago Core, like the skeletons, they actually come from the underworld. That's pretty neat. I will say though, the mech race felt maybe a little bit underwhelming for everything it had been built up to be. Like it was shown in every single trailer. It was some of the first teaser images we saw. And it was a good way for us to see like Aaron and Sora in action for the first time to see them working together. But I don't know, there's a part of me that wishes there was a little bit more to it. Also, this is a very small thing, but it annoys me a little bit that the mech that we actually got in a set is only really shown in the first episode. Like we do see the bike later on, but the mech that Sora uses most of the time is not the mech that the set actually transforms into. Because the one the show just uses like a jetpack for the wheels. This episode also does a great job of setting up Rass as like this big scary villain. He's super cool and I love the fact that the main characters actually lose here to show that like yeah they still do need to be trained. Lloyd's introduction at the end of the episode is done pretty well too. See, so yeah, I think this is a great start. I don't have a ton to say about it because again I feel like I've known about this episode for a while because we already saw so much of it but I think especially for people who are actually like new viewers to the show this is the perfect way to introduce things. Then episode two the merge part two it starts out with some great action. I love seeing Lloyd's reaction to Aaron and Sora and then we learn that Sora's elemental power is like technology. Very interesting. I'm curious how they're going to develop that because like what's 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 the story behind that? The elemental power is obviously a very big deal and we'll get to Wildfire later too who obviously also has an elemental power that seems a little bit unfamiliar but yeah I'm very curious to see where all that goes. We also get to see the merge from Lloyd's perspective in this episode which is one of my favorite scenes in the new show. I love the idea of just Lloyd and Kai being stuck alone and like not knowing what to do that's just such an incredible concept and the fact that it's been years and they think they're the only ninja who survived that's just wild and such a crazy way to mix things up. We're also introduced to the concept of merge quakes here which is very interesting I guess that implies the realms didn't merge entirely right? like parts of every realm came to Ninjago but the other realms still exist and there's still more realm out there just Ninjago itself has expanded with parts of each realm we also see Ryu's family at the end of this episode and the matriarch dragon who can talk which that part that was a little surprising that the dragon could talk but I think it could do a lot for the plot going forward I really want that dragon as an official set I'm hoping she comes as a set next year then we have episode three crossroads carnival and this episode really felt like a season one episode to me you have Lloyd trying to train the new ninja and they're having a tough time with it them sneaking out to the carnival and fighting like this weird weird, obscure one-off villain, who then later becomes a major part of the story. I have to say, when Ninjago Dragons Rising was revealed, I wasn't expecting the Whack Rats from Prime Empire to be a major plot point, but you know what? It, it kind of worked. Also, I guess I didn't mention it yet, but Labo is awesome. He's my favorite new character. <laughs> it was also very sweet to see the memorials for all the ninja, too. It was a bit odd that nobody recognized Lloyd walking around when they have all his memorials right there. Yeah, that's kind of a perfect episode, in my opinion. It ends with, like, a new lesson for Aaron and Sora, as well as for Lloyd. It's got, like, a fun, self-contained adventure, but then it also ties into what happens in later episodes. Incredibly well done in my opinion. Next episode, episode 4 Beyond Madness. This one's very similar, very self-contained story. We get to see the Realm of Madness again, and those are actually Kraglings. We did assume they were Kraglings, but they do actually name drop them. They're the same rock monsters from season 1 in Ninjago, and once again inspired by the Power Miners rock monsters, which is very cool. And of course we have Nia and Kai reintroduced here. I will say this episode maybe dragged on a little bit, maybe felt a little bit longer than it needed to be. However, I don't know. It still expanded the new merged world, introduced those old characters back into the show, and I love the dynamic of Lloyd, Kai, and Neo with the new ninja. It's actually a lot of fun to see them try to operate without the others. Moving on to episode 5, Writers of Destiny, this episode is crazy. This is the episode that made me go, okay, Ninjago is in good hands, because this is just... I, it, it has so much to do with the original show, but it still works for a new audience, right? Like, everything is explained to Aaron and Sora here, but if you're an original fan of Ninjago, this episode does so much more for you. So we see Cloud Kingdom again, which I was kind of dreading because I hate Cloud Kingdom in possession. I think it is such a ridiculous concept that, like, everything is dictated by fate and none of the characters' decisions are truly their own. It's just up to these guys in another realm just writing what's going to happen. I don't know, I never really liked that concept because while, like, destiny and prophecy and fate can play a really cool role in this universe, such as with, like, the Green Ninja prophecy or the great devourer prophecy cloud kingdom just kind of felt like a cop out it's like oh yeah you just write whatever that happens and this episode just sort of rectifies that it kind of implies that the people in cloud kingdom are more just good at making predictions but they don't actually write reality so while they do have a lot of knowledge of what happens if they're actively trying to change reality that can't really happen at least that's how i interpreted it and that in my opinion just fixed a lot of this for me like they're not completely powerless they do have a lot of knowledge but they're not as powerful as they were implied to be back in possession people are calling this a retcon and i guess it kind of is but i don't know in my opinion it's more just kind of fixing bad lore. Also, I guess Cloud Kingdom isn't Cloud Kingdom without some, like, weird animated creatures, because we had Nimbus back in Season 5, and now we have those weird worm things, which <laughs> very disturbing. Then this episode, we also saw some merge quakes with, like, the giant starfish creatures, and that fight scene was incredible. But then the even cooler part was the fact that this episode introduced the all-new Master of Wind. A lot of people were theorizing that Aaron was going to become the new Master of Wind, but nope, it's just some other character. What's her name? Euphrasia. 
Yeah, so the new character Euphrasia is the all-new Master of Wind, which it's so cool to see that finally addressed because ever since Moro died back in Season 5, people have been wondering, will we ever see a new Master of Wind? And the fact that we finally saw one, I don't know, that's super neat. I was a little bit disappointed that she didn't join the main team, but I would be shocked if they never bring her back in the future. It would also be cool to see her get a different design because obviously she was just dressed like all the other Cloud Kingdom people. So it'd be cool to see her stand out more because her face design also seemed kind of generic. But yeah, Lloyd actually references Moro in this episode and it's just so cool to see that finally addressed. Like this truly feels like a sequel to the original Ninjago show. Such a fantastic episode all around. Nia also leaves at the end of this episode, which I was a little bit surprised to see. However, it doesn't take long for her to come back. But then we get to episode six, Return to Imperium. And this is where we get into like a multi-episode arc. I will say, I don't think I enjoyed this like multi-episode arc as much as the first half of the season. Or I guess the first quarter, right? Because this entire thing's the first half. But I still do like it a lot. The animation was a little bit weird at the beginning. I think it was meant to look like a sunny morning. However, it was kind of the same lighting they used for their flashback scene. So that felt very confusing for me. But this is the episode where we get Sora's backstory. And wow, it's amazing. I love like everything they did with Imperium. They went really far with it. Like what they show Imperium doing to the dragons is pretty dark. I wasn't expecting that. Like obviously it's not as dark of a tone as like Sun's Garment on, but the show is taking itself very seriously. It's not entirely just jokes and whatnot. Like that was incredibly well done. The fact that she also designed the Fotak and the scene with the dragon sword was incredibly heartfelt and touching. And then actually seeing the ninja sneak into Imperium, that was a lot of fun. There was some cool action and some great humor too. There was like that classic Ninjago humor that I'm used to. Again, feels so much like Ninjago season one in the best way possible. Then coming to episode seven, Mindless Beast. Here we get a true introduction to Wildfire. We saw her a little bit at the very end of the last episode, but I actually love her personality. I think she's a ton of fun. I'll get into her more when we talk about the next episode, because that's the episode with her backstory. But yeah, I really like the way she like didn't trust Lloyd at first and the fight scene between the two of them. And then also the Imperium came in and then they were fighting the Imperium together. It was really just nonstop fun. Also, this is a small thing, but the Sora dragon looks like it's based on the J Evo dragon. It's not one-to-one, -one. like they've animated the J Evo dragon before in the core shorts, and this one is different. However, it looks like it uses the same body design, and I find that really funny because I know the core J dragon does a set that a lot of people don't like. I personally, I like it. I think it's goofy, but it's also very fun. But the fact that the core J dragon is now like pretty important to the lore, that's just awesome to me. I will say with this episode, I didn't love the whole Eren plot in this episode. It just kind of felt like it went on too long with him just like hanging out and talking to the Imperium citizens. It does do a good job of showing us like the average citizen's thoughts in Imperium, but I don't know. Every time he came on screen, I was like, all right, let's get back to the other stories because I was just way more interested in what was going on there. But yeah, Sora's escape with, I guess, Sora in this episode was great. The way she got away and snuck around only to be caught again. I really love that whole sequence. Then episode eight, I will be the danger. This episode I really loved. I thought this was a ton of fun. This is the wildfire backstory episode and I thought her backstory was perfect. Such an amazing sequence. The idea of a character being raised by a dragon is just so cute and it's just such a different backstory too. I love Heat Wave too. Unfortunately, I wish the set was a bit different because while I do like the set, it doesn't feel super accurate to the show because in the show, Heat Wave's kind of like a Dilophosaurus. It's got these frills around its neck and I think that's awesome. But unfortunately, that's not really the case with the set. Also, the transformation of the set is just flipping it upside down but in the show she actually changes colors which obviously would be quite difficult to do in lego form but i don't know it makes me wish we got another version of heat wave in the other colors because yeah she looks amazing in the show i just don't feel like the set represents her perfectly i like how they explain wildfire's like very basic understanding of english too and then this is also the episode where kai and nia first follow like the sensei Wu ghost thing so is Sensei Wu just dead? Like, is there any other explanation for this other than Sensei Wu died if this is his spirit? Because I'm trying to think, and I, I don't know, like maybe he's using some ancient spinjutsu technique to like project himself elsewhere, but that spirit was definitely Sensei Wu. So yeah, I think my boy might actually be dead. He might've died in the merge, which is a little bit sad. I do love my boy Wu. But I will say if that's the case, that definitely opens up the series a lot more because that means the ninja are truly on their own. They don't have a master to look to anymore. They have to be the masters themselves. Then we have episode nine, The Calm Inside. This episode starts off with like a flat flashback scene of Lloyd training with Wu when he was younger, and it immediately sticks out that Lloyd's using his legacy design, not his original design, and obviously we know how he looked when he was younger in the show, so it was a bit weird to see him in a different design when he's younger, but I think that's probably for the new fans of the show. Yeah, because if Lloyd looked how he actually did in season one, it would be a little bit confusing why he had black eyes back then and green eyes now, so I kind of get why they chose to use his legacy design. I guess you could see it as sort of like a flawed memory of Lloyd's, right? Like that is what happened, but he's seeing himself more as he is now, just shrunken down, even though that's not actually how he looked as a kid. I know that bothers some people, but personally, I don't mind it. And I think the scene itself is actually very good. This episode also has a really cool line where the Empress establishes that Roz is not from Imperium. A lot of people are expecting that, me included, because obviously he's the only, like, non-human in the Imperium. But yeah, she straight up calls him an outlander, which means he comes from another realm. And I am really hoping that's Chima, because it would make sense, right? Chima is theoretically somewhere in Ninjago now, right? If all the realms merged, at least part of Chima is now here. So there is going to be a few Chima characters running around. So I think it'd be awesome if one of the main villains of the show came from 
Shima. That's just such a fun idea. Because when I was a kid, Ninjago was cancelled and Shima was introduced. So to a lot of fans, there was always like a rivalry between the two themes. So the fact that we're actually seeing two of those characters fight now, that's like something I always wanted as a kid. I really like that concept. There's a chance he's just from another realm we haven't heard of yet, but I'm really hoping it's Shima because that would be amazing. I will say, as pretty as the animation has been, towards the end of the episode where Lloyd's like thinking about Wu when he sees like this golden spectral Wu, that looked terrible. I don't know why the Wu model looked so bad, but I wish it was like glowing or something, like they did more of that model. Because yeah, that felt very unfinished to me. It was cool seeing all the different dragons in action, like using their powers with Wildfire and Lloyd. However, I will say the idea of the Photak Beast just being completely indestructible feels like kind of a cop-out to me. They did that a lot in the early seasons of Ninjago, where whenever they wanted to create conflict with the villains, it was just like, oh, the villains are indestructible. Like the Stone Warriors were indestructible, except for elemental power, so then they got the elemental blades to destroy them. The Ninjroids were indestructible, so they needed to shut down the power to destroy them. Then the Transform Anachondrite cultists were just too strong to actually fight, so they need to release the spirits of the actual Anaconda to stop them. So yeah, this kind of felt like going back to that. Like, I'm glad there was a way to stop them, but I don't know, it made the whole fight seem feel very anticlimactic. This episode also has kind of follow the Wu spirit, and then it goes into, like, this chamber. And I don't know if anybody else had this thought, but the spirit itself goes inside this, like, metallic chamber, right? And then the two of them have to do work on it, and then they open it up, and it pans up, and you see, like, minifigure legs. And I was like, okay, we saw the Wu spirit go in here. Wu's probably dead. There was, like, a split second there when I thought, oh, wow, they're actually gonna canonize the Wu bot. The Wu bot that we saw in Seabound and Core, this is gonna be Wu now. Wu bot's gonna be real. But no, then it opened up and it was Zane. And I was like, oh, okay, Zane. That, that's cool with me too. Zane's my favorite ninja. I was not expecting them to come back into the show this early. So I think I let out an audible gasp. I was like, oh, Zane. <laughs> So that's very interesting. It implies to me that like Cole and Jay are going to come back in the second half of the season. Probably one of them about halfway through and then the other one at the very end. But this actually makes me very excited that Zane's going to be a part of the main team for like the second half of the season. Also this episode, I like the rivalry between Sora and her former classmate. I thought that was just very funny. And I like how everything ties back to that Lloyd scene in the beginning. And then finally coming to episode 10, we get a lot of questions that we don't yet have answers to. The Imperium Monastery pops up, which like, what is that? Why was Zane there? What? It's like a, th it's a monastery in Imperium, but it's not like owned by the Imperium. It's like a, it's a thing for the ninja. Very curious where that's going to go. Is there one of those in every realm? And like, how did Zane even get there? We're introduced to our first source dragon in this episode too, which seemed like they're going to be a major part of the show going forward. And when it gives Lloyd its power, Lloyd has this really interesting vision where he sees like the graves of all the ninja and these symbols for these six different dragons. I assume one for each of the original ninja because they're the same symbols that we saw in the Temple of the Dragon Energy Core set. And here they were actually colored so it was clear it is energy, ice, earth, lightning, water, and fire. However, the Temple of the Dragon Energy Core also has a seventh symbol too. And yeah, then the end of this episode's neat. I think it's cool how they beat Imperium, but obviously they're not defeated for good because we still have the second half of the season. It's a good place to cut everything off. And then seeing everyone back in the monastery, it looks like Wildfire is a permanent part of the team, which I actually wasn't expecting. I thought she was going to be a one-off side character, but now it looks like she's one of the ninja now. So it definitely makes me wish she came in more than one set this wave. And also wish that she had more than one face friend, because yeah, the fact that she's stuck always angry, while it does fit her personality, would have been nice to have maybe a neutral expression at the very least. Maybe not happy, but at the very least neutral. And then the very end obviously opened up a lot of questions too. The Empress is going out in her mech, and then she just sort of threw Roz in a cage. Not entirely sure why she did that. Because like, yeah, he did lose to Eren and Sora, but I don't know, he hasn't messed up as much as Rapton has, and Rapton's fine. <laughs> but I'm curious where that's going to go with him for the second half of the season. Is he going to turn against the Empress? Is he going to maybe join the ninja? I doubt that because he definitely seems very evil. But yeah, maybe he's going to be more of like an anti-hero also fighting the Empress but not working with the ninja. But yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of things I didn't mention because I had lots of thoughts of these while I was watching them and I was clicking through them while talking. That's why I was looking down. I was trying to remind myself of everything that happened in the episode. But I'm sure I missed a lot of it. So that's why I'm also doing a live stream this weekend and I'll be talking to other people too so we'll be able to bounce off each other. And it's just going to be a big live stream talking about both the sets and the show. It's probably going to be in the evening Eastern time. Don't have an exact time yet, but it's probably going to start somewhere between like three and six. Eastern time and then run however long it does. But yeah, if you want to hear even more thoughts from me, just stay tuned for them. But overall, I love this season so far. Like, obviously, nothing's without its flaws. But in my opinion, it's already in some of my top Ninjago seasons ever. That being said, I hope it pulls through in the second half because that's the same thing I said about Crystallized Part 1. And while I do still like Crystallized overall, the second half is not nearly as good as the first half, in my opinion. With the second half, Crystallized went from like a top 3 season to like a top 10. So I'm really hoping Dragon's Rising doesn't do the same. Curious to see where they go in the first two episodes in the next season. Because I definitely preferred like the single self-contained episodes to, like the multi-episode arcs. But I love that we're getting backstories for all the characters. I love that nothing feels rushed. In fact, it almost feels like the opposite. Some things last maybe a little bit too long. But even still, I don't think that's been the worst. The only parts that maybe felt a little bit too long to me were the part with Aaron with the other civilians. That was like over the course of two episodes and it probably could have been reduced down to just one. And then all the dragons fighting the Fotax. However, the action's fun, the animation's great. And I think Ninjago has a bright future ahead. And I'm really looking forward to what's in store.
But of course, those are just my thoughts. Let me know what you guys thought this season so far in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and stay tuned for my live stream on Sunday. But as of this video, I think that's about all I have to say. So thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Bye. <music>